Landholders' Right to Refuse Gas and Coal Bill 2013, resumption of second reading debate. Um, Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. Uh, I rise to speak to the Greens Bill, the Landholders' Right to Refuse Gas and Coal Bill of 2013. Now, as people well know, because this bill has been on foot for quite a while, it was on foot in the last parliament, this bill gives landholders the right to say no to dangerous coal seam gas, shale and tight gas mining on their land, as well as to coal mines. Um, here in Australia, as we all know, we have so little good quality farmland, so little good quality agricultural land. It just seems absolutely outrageous to the Greens that on the good quality land we do have, it's not safe from being turned into massive mines and it's not safe from being pockmarked with coal seam gas wells or shale gas wells or tight gas wells. Um, now, the reason that we're so concerned about these um, new and continuing fossil fuel industries is that they are simply a disaster for water, they're bad for land. They're bad for communities. Sadly, they're bad news also for the Great Barrier Reef, and they're terrible for the climate. Now, as people may or may not be aware, and I certainly hope there is a growing awareness in this place of the risks of coal seam gas, um, because it's an issue, I'm afraid, along with shale and tight gas, for all of us here in this chamber. This is all across the country. You cannot simply punch a hole through an aquifer to get to a coal seam without doing damage. So they pockmark the landscape with these massive wells. They then got to dewater the coal seam so that the gas can flow. You've got to put that water somewhere. You've then got to blast in a mixture of again water, um, sand and chemical propants, and who knows what else because they don't tell us, to then fracture open the coal seam so that the gas can flow uh, more quickly. You've then got to suck that um, hydraulic fracturing mixture out as well. You've got to put that somewhere. Um, and then you've got to hope that you've sealed your well properly, because when you're punching holes through aquifers to get to something that's underlying, if your well casings aren't completely solid, well then of course you're going to risk contamination. Um, we also know that those, um, those wells create pressure changes, particularly in the Great Artesian Basin. So you've got the potential for the groundwater level to drop, you've got the potential for the residual fracking fluids and even the naturally occurring carcinogens, benzene, toluene, ethylene um, and xylene, which can be mobilised by that very fracking process. You've got the potential for those to then shift up into those aquifers. So we have serious risks here with contamination of our most precious resource here in Australia, the driest inhabited continent on the planet. Um, water contamination, you've got that potential dropping of the groundwater table. And of course, the water that's sucked out of those coal seams is very salty. Now, I am old enough to remember when salinity was the biggest problem facing this country, and sadly, this industry will only make that problem worse. Um, once those uh, massive lakes of produced water start to evaporate, what do you then do with the salt? I was on a Senate inquiry when I first started my role in this place, speaking for Queenslanders, and the industry does not have a solution to what they will do with all of that salt. They're now seeking permission to try and um, bury it somewhere. Well, they better not do it um, anywhere in the Murray-Darling catchment or there will be uh, an awful lot of environmental damage done. On that very point, I want to mention that the National Water Commission, um, it's not just the Greens saying this, of course it's the scientists saying this, the National Water Commission has said that coal seam gas development represents, and I quote, a substantial risk to sustainable water management given the combination of uncertainty about water impacts, the significance of the potential impacts and the long time period over which they may emerge and continue to have effect. The point is here, water moves really slowly. And if you're changing that pressure, and if you haven't quite sealed your well properly, then you might find in 50 years' time your bores dried up. Of course, the, the company's up and left by then, so all of their promises that they'll truck you in water, well, they're meaningless because the company's not there anymore. These industries only, the wells only have a, a 20 to 30 year lifespan. That's not a sort of risk that the Greens want to take with our water. It's not the sort of risk we want to take with our food security. On that point, it's not limited to water impacts. We know that there are surface impacts from coal seam gas and also, obviously, from coal mining. Um, it's not just the well pad as the 
um, very highly paid and slick um, merchants of the coal seam gas industry will try to assuage people's fears on. It's not just the well pad. It's the roads to get in and out to the well pad. It's the pipelines to get the gas out. It's the, often the diesel generators or the overhead power lines to power the site. And it's the people coming onto your land at all hours of the day and night. And you don't have the right to say no. The only right the landholder has is to argue about how much compensation they might get for this potentially irreparable damage to their groundwater and to this massive disturbance in their way of life and to their surface farming operations. Of course we know that the industry would say that this is the solution to climate change, so much cleaner than coal. Well, I wish that were the case. Sadly, it's not. Sure, it burns cleaner, but by the time you've extracted the gas, you've uh, piped it to the liquefaction plant for export, because much of this is, of course, for export, and there's a growing debate about that. Um, liquefied it and then shipped it off, you have um, expended an awful lot of energy and, importantly, it's those pipes and wells that leak. People here, I hope, have heard of fugitive emissions. It is those leaking wells and pipes, because coal seam gas is methane. Um, it, it, that, it's 26 more times as potent as carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So when you have these leaking wells and pipes, you have a massive energy footprint to liquefy this stuff for export. You are cancelling out any of the benefits that you might claim at the ultimate burning um, stage at the very end of this fuel. So it is no solution to climate change, and in fact, um, it is every bit as dirty as coal. Now, in that export process, a lot of it's through the Great Barrier Reef. Now, I'm from Queensland, and Queenslanders love our reef. Australians love our reef. The world loves our reef. It's world heritage. It's an international icon. It's one of the seven natural wonders of the world. It's now being pocked with massive ports, ex either expansions or new ports, um, massive dredging program, the biggest the reef has ever seen. Of course, a lot of that dredge spoil, that sludge, then gets dumped offshore, creating even more water quality problems, problems for coral, for seagrasses, the feeding and breeding grounds for turtles and dugongs. And the shipping, if all of these projects go ahead, we'll see one ship every hour and a half going through the Great Barrier Reef. Is our reef simply just to be a highway for coal ships and for gas ships? I think actually it's a biodiversity icon that we should be doing everything we can to protect. These are the reasons that the Greens are opposing coal seam gas. It interferes with farming operations. It potentially damages water supply forevermore. It's terrible for the climate. It's terrible for the reef. And it is ripping apart communities. Farmers are being forced to sign up to confidentiality agreements so that they can't speak with their neighbours about how much compensation they got or how much did you get. Um, people know they have no right to say no. They're being worn down over years of pressure um, from these big companies. In the end, they're forced to sign up. They then can't talk about it. This is really ripping communities apart. But I'm proud to say that in Queensland and certainly now in the southern states, learning from Queensland, there is a really strong community movement that's opposing this dangerous industry. I want to pay tribute um, to people from Lock the Gate Alliance who are up there in the public gallery today. We've got Phil Laird there, who's the national um, coordinator of Lock the Gate, uh, Anne, and of course Innes Larkin, who is a Queenslander. Um, they've come here this week to speak with all of you, and I hope that people have made the time to meet with them. Um, some of these people are, are conservationists. Innes is an eco-tourist operator. Phil's a farmer. Um, we've got Indigenous people in the delegation as well. There is a broad range of real people who are concerned about coal seam gas. Um, they've met with, with us. I hope they've met with you. I know they've been meeting with a number of other parties. They've taken the time to share their concerns. Now, Innes is an ecotourism operator in um, the Scenic Rim, the Green Cauldron of Australia. A beautiful area. In fact, it's one of the 16 national landscapes that was recognised by the previous government last year. Ironically, of those 16 landscapes, as Innes was telling me yesterday, 11 of those are threatened with coal seam gas or coal mining. What a farce. What an absolute farce. Um, Doug Balrabes was also in the delegation. Now, he's a winemaker, a vigneron. Um, from South Australia, and there are many folk in this chamber who not only um, indulge in some wine now and then, but also are vineyards themselves. You simply cannot have industries coexisting with coal seam gas. It destroys the land, it destroys the water supply, 
and it rips communities apart, and it is no solution to climate change and it's destroying our reef. Now, the genesis of this bill were some remarks by, of all people, Tony Abbott back in 2011. Um, he was not the Prime Minister at the time, obviously, but he'd made some comments that he thought landholders should have the right to say no um, to this industry. We welcomed those statements, um, and within uh, a few days we were able to have a bill drafted and brought that in to this place for debate, giving landholders that right to say no to coal seam gas. Uh, sadly, Tony Abbott, uh, Mr Tony Abbott, now the Prime Minister, then changed his mind within the space of 24 hours, and he backed down from those comments. Um, we don't give up. We've continued to, to work on this issue. We're bringing this bill forward again. Um, and the coalition, likewise, still purport to hold these views. In their own election document, they say that access to prime agricultural land should only be allowed with the farmer's agreement, that the farmer should have the right to say yes or no to coal seam gas exploration and extraction on their property. Well, we welcome that commitment and we would just love you to follow through on it here in this federal parliament. Um, you have the legislation before you. Hell, do your own if you don't like ours. We don't care whose name is on the bit of paper. These landholders just need the right to protect their land from this dangerous fossil fuel industry. Um, likewise, when Mr Tony Abbott recently visited Tara, one of the beautiful places in my home state of Queensland, um, gorgeous bushland, a lot of people suffering there, a, a very low socioeconomic background, a lot of people who have gone there for some peace and quiet and sadly now have their lives destroyed by a multitude of different coal seam gas exploration um, companies. Tony Abbott, when he was in Tara, made a promise um, to Debbie Orr, who, uh, one of the residents there, who says no one should be forced to have a gas well on their property. Well, what are you going to do about it? If you purport to hold these views, please follow through on them. Um, from what I've heard so far, and the government will speak for themselves and I don't wish to verbal them, but as I understand it, they purport to hold these views, but they don't think it's up to them to give landholders that right. They think that that should be up to the state governments. Well, two things on that. The state governments have done an absolutely rotten job in protecting our land and our water and our climate from coal seam gas. This industry has just steamrolled ahead. There has been virtually no constraints on it whatsoever. Um, promises are sometimes made. They're rarely followed through on. So I sadly have very limited confidence in the state government's political will to seriously address this problem or to represent those people as they should be doing. Um, the second point, of course, is that there's no reason why this needs to be left up to the state governments. There is no constitutional limitation on the federal government to step in and give landholders the right to say no to coal seam gas, shale gas, tight gas and coal mining on their land. There are a myriad of powers that the Commonwealth could rely on. Corporations' power is perhaps the most obvious, um, but there are others. There is no excuse to not take this step other than, actually, you're in the pocket of those fossil fuel industries. And I was incredibly saddened, though not surprised, to see that the National Party in South Australia have taken donations from Santos, one of the big coal seam gas companies, more than $200,000. That was very shocking to me, and we, that came to light last week. may well explain um, the position that, sadly, they've taken. So I've talked about the need for action federally. Um, we have had some action in this place. We now have a water trigger in our federal environmental laws. Now That is a good start. What that says is if you've got a big uh, coal mine or a coal seam gas operation that's going to have a significant impact on a water resource, the federal environment minister needs to have a look at that, um, and the approval of that minister is required before it can proceed. Now, the Greens, when that legislation was coming through this place, tried to amend that to expand it and include shale gas and tight gas um, to, to help our communities in Western Australia, South Australia, the Northern Territory and, of course, Tasmania, all of those places now at risk um, from shale gas and also from coal seam gas. Sadly, we didn't get support for that at the time, but I do want to pay tribute um, to the efforts of the community in creating the pressure for that water trigger to be passed and, of course, to the former um, independent Tony Windsor um, for his work, um, seminal work, in working with the Greens as well as the community and the government at the time to pass those laws. The problem is those laws give the Environment Minister the ability to say no to coal and coal seam gas. Nobody ever has. There's not been a coal seam gas project or a coal mine that's been refused um, in living memory under these laws or even under the previous laws. This is exactly why we need landholders 
to have the right to say no. It's all very well to give the minister the ability to do so, but if you're in the pocket of the fossil fuel industry, it's no wonder that you just tick off on everything that passes your desk. Um, I'm really proud that we've had folk here from Lock the Gate. Um, they're here to support this bill. They're here to support their own rights to protect their land and continue to farm it into the future and to provide the food that we all rely on. Um, some people say this is just a country issue. It's not just a country issue. We all eat and we all drink. And you can't eat coal and you can't drink gas. And I know in Brisbane there is a growing movement of people, and I'm convinced that it's around the country as well of people who want to support our farmers on the land by buying locally produced food. They want to keep their own carbon footprint low and they want to support their local farmers. So this is an issue that touches all of us in Australia. Now, last uh, weekend, I uh, um, worked with our mining spokesperson in New South Wales, Jeremy Buckingham, to fund the travel of um, a rancher from Wyoming, John Fenton, who, if any of you have watched the movie Gasland, and if you haven't, please do, um, his, his ranch has been completely destroyed um, by fracking for shale gas. His water has now been poisoned, to the extent that the authorities have said to him, you better leave the windows open when you take a shower because your water might actually explode. This is no joke. This is actually what, this, what John and his family are now living under. This is what could happen here if we don't arrest this dangerous industry. Seriously, are we going to let that happen to our own people? I hope not. This is one way of helping to stop that. Now, um, if you won't listen to the science, and we know that science ain't so popular anymore under this government, more's the pity. We have no science minister, as we all know, and apparently climate science is, is still crap. But if you want to listen only to the polls, then there's been some recent polls um, in New South Wales. 75 per cent of voters oppose coal seam gas on agricultural land. That follows an, er an earlier poll that showed that 68 per cent of Australians want to stop coal seam gas until it's been proven safe for our land and our water and our environment and our communities. So clearly, this is a concern to Australians. It's something that represents a massive risk. It's, it's an industry that's rolled out so quickly it's gotten ahead of the science. And I think in Queensland it almost got ahead of the communities. But now we have strong networks of people, both in the bush and in the city, who are standing firm to protect land and water from coal seam gas. And I want to um, not finish my contribution without mentioning that this bill also covers coal mining. We know the massive destruction that coal mining can do to forests. We know the interference that it can have with the water table. We, of course, know the massive climate impacts. But I want to mention again um, Phil Laird, the coordinator of Lock the Gate, who's, as I said, in the gallery. He lives near um, the Laird Forest, which, of course, is going to be hugely impacted by the Malls Creek mine, a 23 megaton coal mine that's proposed there. Now, interestingly, of course, approval for that was given because, you know, apparently all we do is tick and flick here when it comes to fossil fuel projects. That mine was required to offset its damage to the vegetation that it would clear, critically endangered box gum woodland. Okay, critically endangered. We don't have much of it left. An offset was required to be provided to offset the damage, of the loss of that critical um, habitat. Well, in fact, the offset that's now proposed has got 5 per cent box gum in it. The rest of it is a completely entirely different ecosystem. Um, so the farce that are these approvals that are handed out with almost no scrutiny for an industry that is dangerous for the climate and that rips up communities and undermines our precious habitat, it just boggles the mind. The state laws are too weak. Landholders across the country in the main do not have the right to say no to this dangerous industry. They should have that right. This industry has rolled out too fast. It's gotten ahead of the science and we are doing potentially irreversible damage to our groundwater table and to our climate. I've been out to these communities. I've, I've been to Tara. I've flown over and seen um, the, the grill. Um, it's hard to describe. You've just got a grill pad of wells. It doesn't look like a landscape anymore. It is just pockmarked with wells. I've been out to Narrabri. I've been to Roma. I've been to the Kimberley. I've seen the beauty of these places and the damage that can be done. Please, today, search your consciences, um, have a look at the science, take the chance to speak with the people who've come from your state, from Lock the Gate Alliance, to speak with you and raise their concerns. Please think seriously about following through on the government's own election commitment to give landholders the right to say no. Don't just leave it up to the states. They're not doing it. That's why we need this bill. 
We've got to protect our land and our water and our communities and our climate and our reef from this dangerous industry. We've got that opportunity today, and I beg you to seriously consider supporting this bill. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Waters.